hello beautiful people welcome back to my channel if you're new here my name is brina and today is a brand new episode of didn't make up the mystery it's been a while since i've had one of these videos i know i swear i'm gonna try to upload them more but i also want to mention that i don't really love the name didn't make up the mystery still i really don't know what i want to call this series yeah so if you have any better suggestions let me know in the comments i think mainly what i want to talk about in this series is probably going to be like serial killers just because that's what fascinates me the most but i still really want to talk about things that have absolutely nothing to do with murder so i don't know <laughs> like I said, let me know what your suggestions are in the comments, please. And for now, I guess we'll just continue calling it Didn't Make Up the Mystery. And I think this has been long enough of an intro, so let's just get right into today's story. Today, we're going to be talking about Charles Starkweather and Carol Ann Fugate. It's a journey. So, Charles Raymond Starkweather was born November 24th, 1938 in Lincoln, Nebraska. He was the third of seven children to Guy and Helen Starkweather. He was born into a working class family. His father, Guy, was considered mild-mannered and he would usually work as a carpenter, though he had rheumatoid arthritis in his hands, so he was often unemployed due to being in pain and whenever his father Guy was unemployed his mother Helen would work as a waitress to help supplement the family's income. Charles was also born with genu varum which basically just means he was bow-legged so because of his deformity um Charles did not have the easiest time in school he was bullied quite often. As a result of his bullying, when Charlie got older, he learned that the gym was a very good outlet for his rage. As a result of that, he learned that he was now strong enough to fight back against those that had bullied him. So that's exactly what he did. By the time he was a teenager, Charlie was not a very big man. He was pretty stocky and well-built, but he only stood five feet, five inches tall. He also had a reputation as the man who would just randomly yell go to hell to strangers on the street so he went from being a pretty well-behaved child to one of the most troubled teenagers in his community in 1956 charles is 18 years old when he's introduced to 13 year old carol ann fugate they were introduced by carol's older sister barbara who was dating one of charlie's close friends at the time and now like i know the 50s were a different time but what older sister in her right mind would want to introduce her 13 year old little sister to an 18 year old man as a potential partner i know the 50s were a different time but Moving on, Charlie had decided that he wanted to drop out of high school his senior year, so he got a job at a Western Union newspaper warehouse, and the reason why he picked this job was twofold. Number one, because it was a job and he needed a job, but number two, and more importantly, it was very close to Carol's school her middle school, might I add. Yes, that's how young she is. This relationship is just already crawling under my skin and just bothering me because it's so inappropriate. <laughs> Anyways, having a job very close to Carol's school allowed Charlie the ability to see her every day, and that's basically all he cared about. Charlie had a 1949 Ford car, and one day he decided he wanted to teach Carol how to drive. So this kind of, I think, became a more common thing for them to do together, and one day when they're out practicing driving, Carol crashes the car into another car. But it turns out that the car isn't actually actually in Charles's name. It's actually in his father Guy's name. So Guy willingly pays the damages, but when him and Charlie get home, they argue about the incident. Guy is just really uncomfortable with the fact that Charlie let his 13-year-old unlicensed girlfriend drive his car and then she crashed it. So they argued about this and eventually Guy banishes Charlie from the family home because he just cannot condone his son's behavior. After this little incident, Charles decided to quit his job at the warehouse and he became a garbage collector. It was around the same time that he began to develop this nihilistic worldview where he was believing that 
the situation that he was in would last forever and that this is how the rest of his life was going to turn out. So he began plotting bank robberies along his garbage route. Although instead of actually committing a bank robbery, he just jumped straight into murder. On December 1st, 1957, it was in the very early morning hours, Charles had been returning to the same service station over and over again. Originally, he had tried to buy a stuffed animal for Carol on credit, but the attendant refused to sell this teddy bear to him on credit because if you can't afford a stuffed animal, probably don't, don't buy it. I mean, I wouldn't sell somebody a stuffed animal on credit, but nonetheless, this really upset Charles and he just kept returning to the service station throughout the night, making very small purchases until in the early morning hours of December 1st, he returned with a shotgun. He pulled the gun on Robert, who was 21 years old and recently discharged from the Navy. Charlie forced Robert to give him $100 from the till and then he drove him to a remote area. And I'm assuming at this point, Robert was thinking to himself, I've got to do something here because if not, I'm probably not going to survive this day. So they, a fight for the gun ensues and Robert ends up getting injured during the struggle, allowing Charles to gain full access to the shotgun and he shoots oh my, and he shoots Robert in the head. So initially they aren't able to connect Charles to the murder of Robert. So he just goes about living his life for the next month and a half or so until January 21st, 1958, when he goes to Carol Fugate's house with intentions of picking her up for what reason? I don't know. But apparently Carol had broken up with him just two days prior. So when Charlie shows up, her mother Velda and her stepfather Marion Bartlett tell Charlie he needs to stay away from Carol and that she doesn't want to see him. She broke up with him for a reason. You know, the normal things that a parent would tell an ex-boyfriend. But instead of just leaving like a normal person, Charlie decides to kill Carol's parents. He shoots both Velda and Marion. Then he turns his anger to their two-year-old daughter, Betty Jean. He strikes her, causing blunt force trauma before strangling her to death. Charlie hid all three bodies in an outbuilding in the back of the property. And it's very unclear as to whether or not Carol was actually home during the time that all this was happening. But Charlie would later claim that she was there, witnessed the whole thing. Carol has a very contradicting account of what happened that day. Carol claims she came home later on and was met by Charlie who had a gun and told her that if she cooperated with him, he would not hurt her family. Claiming she had no idea her family was already dead, but the couple then stays in the family's home for the next six days and numerous people show up at the house, numerous family members, including Carol's sister, her brother-in-law, her grandma, even Charlie's brother show up at the house wondering what's going on. Carol turns everyone away saying her family is terribly sick. She even posts a note on the door saying, stay away. Everybody is sick with the flu. Then she signed it Miss Bartlett and underlined that twice. She claims that the reason why she had posted this note was she was trying to get a warning out, she says, because the only Miss Bartlett that lived in in her home was her two-year-old sister. So she thought maybe this would alert somebody and they would help her. That's what she claims. Eventually her grandmother did threaten to call the police and this was enough to scare the two into fleeing Carol's home. They then headed 15 miles southeast to Bennett, Nebraska. They end up at the farmhouse of 70-year-old August Meyer. He opens the door for the pair and he notices that as they were driving onto his property, their car got bogged down in the mud. So August offers up a couple of his horses to help them free their car. The three of them start heading down to the stables with August leading the way. This is when Charlie decides 
to pull his shotgun and shoot August in the back of the head. Then he beat the old man's dog to death, breaking his shotgun in the process. According to Carol, she was not at all expecting this brutality from him, and that combined with his earlier threat convinced her that her only option was to obey Charles. And since, you know, Charlie kind of prematurely killed August and their car is still stuck in the mud, they have to hoof it until 17-year-old Robert Jensen and his 16-year-old girlfriend Carol King stop and offer the two a ride. The two gladly accept and then once they get in the car, Charlie demands they drive them to a storm cellar. After they arrive, Charlie brutally rapes Carol King and murders both her and Robert. Although this is where I'm not really sure of the story because Carol King's body was found badly mutilated. And the theory here is that maybe Charlie didn't actually kill Carol. Maybe it was Carol Fugate who killed Carol King. Because remember, Charlie just raped the other Carol, which quite possibly could make his Carol jealous. So there's a theory that there was some female rage, jealousy, or something behind that mutilation because she was the only body that was found mutilated. It's the only one that's like really different and out of place from the rest of the murders. So this is the only murder I believe possibly could have been committed by Carol Fugate. But at the same time, I don't know. But either way, the couple now has a new car and they start heading back to Lincoln looking for a place to hide out and they just happen to start searching this upper middle class neighborhood. When they find the house of a prominent local businessman named C. Lauer Ward. He and his wife Clara are not presently home when Charles and Carol show up there but their maid Lillian Fensel is. Firstly Charles kills Lillian then he waits for the Wards to return home. He ends up killing both Lauer and Clara and all three bodies are discovered the next day. They decide to steal Mr. Ward's 1956 Packard and they use that to flee the state. I really think that if, so obviously once people discover the bodies, they're probably also going to soon realize that the Packard is missing. So they're probably gonna be in search of that. But they did have a pretty good lead on any authorities that would be after them. So that probably worked in their favor. The couple's ultimate goal was to make it to Washington State because Charles had a brother who lived there and they were planning to hide out with him for a little while. But when they were right outside of Douglas, Wyoming, Charlie decided that their car was too hot so he needed to ditch it and find a new one. This is when he spots a car on the side of the road. Inside the car is Merle Collison, a 37 year old shoe salesman who is taking a nap and Charlie approaches the vehicle, taps on the window to wake Merle. Once he's awake, Charlie proceeds to shoot through the glass and demand Merle exit the vehicle. Obviously Merle refuses because this crazy man is obviously trying to steal his car. So Charlie continues firing, subsequently killing Merle. Around the same time, a Sinclair oil landman named Joe Sprinkle just happens to be coming upon this little incident. He sees the two cars parked on the side of the road and stops to offer his assistance, not knowing at all what he's walking into. Once Charlie notices Joe, he hurriedly approaches him and tells him, hey, we can't get this newfangled emergency brake on Merle's car to release, so could you help us with it? And Joe says, yeah, sure, of course. So he walks up to the car, but it's not until he's right next to the car that he notices Merle's body shoved underneath the dashboard. At this point, obviously he freaks out and realizes he's in danger. He takes in all five foot five of Charlie and standing at six feet tall himself, Joe decides he's gonna put up a fight. So a wrestling match for the gun ensues. Eventually Joe manages to wrench it away and around this same time a fourth car pulls up. This time it just so happens to be Natrona County Deputy Sheriff William Romer. Once he gets out to investigate a young girl bolts from Merle's car, Carol, screaming he's going to kill me, he's crazy, he just killed a man. Charlie realizes that there is now a Deputy Sheriff there so he jumps back into the Packard and flees towards Douglas. Deputy Romer chooses to stay behind with Carol to make sure she's okay, make sure Joe's okay, assess the situation, but he radios in for help. 
So Douglas Police Chief Bob Ainsley and a Converse County Sheriff, Earl Heflin, immediately set up a roadblock near the Douglas city limit. Though this does not stop Charles, he just speeds right on through it and a high-speed chase ensues through downtown Douglas. They were going over 100 miles per hour at points, so this is a very dangerous situation. And while police chief Bob Ainsley is driving the car following Charles, Sheriff Heflin is in the passenger seat shooting at the Packard. Eventually, one of the shots breaks the back glass of the Packard. Charles immediately slams on the brakes and comes to a stop. After several tense moments of the cops ordering Charles out of the car, him not complying, he eventually surrenders. When asked why Charlie surrendered. Sheriff Heflin responded, I guess he thought he was bleeding to death. That's the kind of yellow SOB he is. I don't really know what that means, but... When the glass shattered, flying glass shards had nicked Charlie's ear in his right hand. Plus he had run out of ammunition, so at this point I think he just kind of realized that it was over and he either was going to die or come out of this in custody of the police. The very next day after his capture, Charles Starkweather appears in front of a Converse County Justice of the Peace. He's been charged with the first degree murder of Merle Collison in the state of Wyoming, but remember he committed all those other murders in Nebraska. So the governor of Wyoming decided to defer to Nebraska prosecutors and extradition papers were signed immediately. The very next day, January 31st, 1958, Charles Starkweather was extradited back to Nebraska. His trial began in May, and against Charlie's wishes, his attorneys offered up an insanity defense. But it didn't work, and on May 23rd, he was found guilty and sentenced to death. Then the following year, on June 25th, 1959, Charles Starkweather was executed by the electric chair. Now, Carol's legal journey is much more complicated than Charles. Obviously, everybody knew Charles had committed all these murders. I'm sure he kind of admitted to them, plus he had Carol there to witness everything. And like I said, we're really not sure to what extent her role in all of this was. Was she a victim? Was she truly kidnapped by Charlie? Or was she a willing participant in this? Nobody really knows. So after she had surrendered, obviously Carol was very agitated, nervous, upset, and in a state of shock. I think anybody would be, honestly. Even if you were a willing participant, I don't think anybody would be just like thrilled to go to prison, but you know. Once she was at the Douglas County Jail, she grew increasingly more and more agitated until eventually the Converse County Sheriff had to have her sedated. The following morning, she cried and screamed for her mother, wondering why she couldn't call her parents. After Nebraska authorities had confirmed that her family was dead, Sheriff Heflin told reporters, I don't think she knew her folks were killed. After the news was broke to her, she broke down and began twisting tissues into tiny little dolls. And initially after they were captured, Starkweather identified Carol as his girlfriend and captive, insisting she had nothing to do with anything, even saying at one point she tried to get away a couple of times. Nevertheless, Nebraska prosecutors decided to charge Carol with murder. Her lawyers fully expected Wyoming law enforcement officials to help their case and to co corroborate what Carol was saying on the stand because she did choose to testify at her own trial. But in surprise testimony, Sheriff Romer testified that Carol had admitted to seeing her family murdered. She even added several credible details to her account that only somebody who was there would truly know. So for me, this part is where it gets a little bit, this is, I just really don't know because was she actually there or did Charlie maybe inform her of what transpired after it happened? Obviously he would know all the details of what happened. So he could have relayed that information to Carol. Then Sheriff Heflin got on the stand and backed up Sheriff Romer's story, adding that when the two were captured, Carol had clippings in her pocket related to her family's murder so clearly she at least knew about it so the whole her crying for her mom I don't know was that an act or was she just truly that hysterical and 
out of it that she really just wanted her mom. I don't know. Maybe she forgot. Our brains do have a tendency to block out really traumatic experiences, so maybe she was there and witnessed it and just tried to forget that it ever happened. I really don't know. Or maybe it was just all an act. By the time Carol's trial had began, Charlie had flipped on her, saying that she was not a unwilling participant and that she actually had participated in some of the murders. He had now claimed that Carol Fugate killed Carol King. Carol would cl later claim that she had not killed Carol King, but she did admit that she did hold a gun on them. So, I don't know. Based on the evidence that was presented at Carol's trial, as well as the damning testimony from Charles Starkweather and the two sheriffs from Wyoming, and the fact that the jury just did not find Carol's testimony credible, Carol, who was, keep in mind, 14 years old at the time of the killing spree, was convicted and sentenced to life in prison. Carol spent the next 17 years in the Nebraska Correctional Center for Women in York, where she was considered a model prisoner. Her sentence ended up being reduced due to a Supreme Court ruling on minors, and she ended up getting paroled in 1976 because of this ruling. Following her release, she moved to Michigan, where she did her best to live as quietly and as normal as she possibly could. In 2007, she married a man named Frederick Clare, a machinist who also worked as a weather observer for the National Weather Service. Then on August 5th, 2013, Carol was seriously injured in a single vehicle accident. Her husband, who was driving their sport utility vehicle when it went off the road and overturned, sadly died at the scene of the accident. Carol has requested a pardon a couple of times. Her most recent request for a pardon was denied by the Nebraska Parole Board in February of 2020. But in a twist of events, but in a twist of events, her second pardon application was supported by one of the relatives of the murder victims. The granddaughter of Lauer and Clara Ward, Eliza Ward, had become very in interested in her grandparents' murder and decided to investigate the case further. And she claimed that as soon as she started to look into it, she just got this bad feeling. And she truly believes Carol Fugate was a victim in all of this and not somebody who willingly participated. Although she seems to be the only family member of the victims that feels this way. And she was pretty upset when the Nebraska Parole Board decided to make their investigation without even hearing any testimony. The reason all this happened is because they felt that the role of a pardon is to restore a felon's rights, not to absolve them of their crimes, because in her request for her pardon, Carol had admitted that the perception that she willingly joined Charles Starkweather in this murder spree is just too much for her to bear. She hoped that by receiving this pardon, it would help alleviate some of the terrible burden she was feeling. So, I mean, I understand why they just immediately denied her because, yeah. But what do you think? My thoughts are that she was only 14 years old when all of this happened. So I really think that even if she was involved in any of the murders or anything, she spent 17 years behind bars. I really, I really think that to send somebody away to prison for the rest of their life, you really need to, especially when they're 14 years old, you really need to know all the facts, know for sure without any doubt in your mind that this child, because that is what she was, a child, 100% willingly participated in these murders. I really don't think she did. I like like I said, she had supposedly broken up with him a couple days prior to this incident, which very likely could have led to his downward spiral. And I think even if she did participate in any of the murders, which I think if she did participate, the only one it, that she would have actually done would have been Carol King. I really think 17 years behind bars was enough time for her. If if she even deserved that much time to begin with, because I really don't think she did. I, she was dating a man much older than her. When you were 14, you were very easily manipulated, especially by somebody who is older than you. So I'd love to hear all your thoughts on this. Do you think Carol was a willing participant? Do you think she was a victim in all of this and she didn't deserve to go to prison? Do you think she didn't get enough time in prison? 
Let me know what your thoughts are on this in the comments. Also, don't forget to let me know if you have any better name suggestions than didn't make up the mystery. Give this video a thumbs up if you enjoyed it. Be sure to hit that subscribe button before you go. Thank you so much for watching and I hope to see you next time. Bye!